So let's start on time. That's wonderful. All right, welcome. Welcome to the new tape group. It's like the world is new. I got a book here. The world is new. So welcome in this in this new world that we're actually entering into. And uh, great that you are part of it, that you decided to join in this adventure with uh, Joel Goldsmith, with The Infinite Way, with the teaching uh, also like com combined in it of Jesus Christ, you could say, of the Master, as Joel calls him, the Master. And so thank you so much for showing up today. Um, yeah, I used the book, like I said, we were going to use the book and we have tapes. So that's one thing that we will see today. And one of the tapes that we're going to listen to later on is then uh, preparing the soil. And preparing the soil uh, came from uh, from the chapter and the creative meditation, the the first chapter in the book, creative meditation. And now that sounds that sounds like a very interesting idea in itself already. Um, but Joel relates it also to um, say preparing yourself for meditation, for receiving something, for receiving communication. Now, the preparation for that is, is basically becoming still, and that's one thing, because in fact, it is the most natural thing to communicate with your Creator. There's, that is so natural. He created you, so that must be very natural. Now, in our um, human, um, say, detour, <laughs> uh, discovering thinking that we are separate from what everything is for for just a moment uh, we need help to come back to the natural recognition of our oneness with god now there's the new world completely say based on recognizing what is true letting go releasing what is not uh, not so what is an illusion or what is mesmerism as joel says it and um seeing that you never lost anything your your um, happiness is not didn't go anywhere your complete fulfillment didn't go anywhere your safety and comfort didn't go anywhere so that's that's great so it is it is pretty amazing i i said it the other day too is like it's amazing to to meet here and it's only like seven days after uh, the resurrection experience that we had last week. Like there was there was a real incredible shift happening, and uh, I know for many of you that has been an, uh, quite an experience too, and uh, especially also the week after. So to to already say let this reconfigure into a new form is. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful that that can happen. It is also brand new. I have to admit that too. It's like it's it's brand new for me to to uh, say come with this, to let this um, flow through me and and through you, um, in a whole new time and like in a whole new time and a whole new way, because that is that is what is occurring. Like there's nothing to to grab back to like. Okay, um, what did we do last week? Like, I no, don't ask me. I have no idea. So, um, long story short, you could say that this is our first meeting again, and of course, in this tape group, it is our first meeting. So that that invites you uh, to open your ears to um, to listen to the still small voice or maybe it's not so still after all it's like it is it is actually related to you being willing to listen to it now yeah, the more you the more you're willing to listen to it the clearer it will be if there's a lot of distraction and turmoil and uh, static then there's no way that you can hear the voice so that's why we always start in these meetings with and this is of course the first one we start in this meeting with um, a meditation say based on 
becoming quiet and feeling a sense of security and safety that has nothing to do with this world but everything to do with you and this to allow the static and the, the distraction to to calm down just and let everything clear up within you so that you can hear the voice and you can actually hear what Joel is sharing and you become receptive and say are suddenly finding yourself of discovery of a whole new world and um, Joel says in the in, in this book like in the the world is new in in the first chapter he says this it's like creative meditation um, is, is basically like uh, allowing a moment of communication with your creator so it's like that that is the occurrence that's where you will find your your safety and comfort and your security and but that's not as easy as it sounds so it's like that really asks of you that you say are willing to release what you held on to for a moment i think is so important like for now that is not important you can definitely let it go and even just for this time that we're together or even during the meditation so it is really like the invitation to let this moment of quiet be total for yourself so that you can dive deeply into uh, what is given in fact quieting down your mind opening up your consciousness and see that there is something so safe and so secure and so whole and so recognizable that you you have a hard time coming back out of it so this is my intention for this and i'm sharing some uh, some text that i say put on a sheet so i see like i said it's it's really focusing on your safety and security so it's very comforting though i make my bed in hell thou art there with me god in the midst of me is mighty so yeah it's good to relax and to breathe and yeah it's like get a sense of oh, i need to do nothing right now just relaxing right into this though i make my bed in hell thou art with me here god in the midst of me is mighty i am i already am and that which i am seeking i already am i am in the secret place of the most high I am about my father's business. My ours, eyes are closed to discords and inharmonies, to appearances and temptations. I do not see and I do not hear evil. Even, even though I see the appearance of evil, I do not accept it as reality. I see it as a shadow, which I neither hate, love, nor fear. I behold God alone, God appearing as the life of all being. I'll read it once more. Though I make my bed in hell, thou art there with me. God in the midst of me is mighty. I am, I already am, and that which I am seeking, I already am. I am in the secret place of the Most High. I am about my father's business. My eyes are closed to discords and inharmonies, to appearances and temptation. I do not see and I do not hear evil. 
Even though I see the appearance of evil, I do not accept it as reality. I see it as a shadow, which I neither hate, love, nor fear. I behold God alone, God appearing as the life of all being. So we will be quiet for, say, four minutes or so. Même si je fais mon lit en enfer, tu es là avec moi. Dieu, au milieu de moi, est puissant. Je le suis, je le suis déjà, et ce que je cherche, je le suis déjà. Je suis dans le lieu secret du Très-Haut. Je m'occupe des affaires de mon Père. Mes yeux sont fermés aux discordes et aux inharmonies, aux apparences et aux tentations. Je ne vois pas et je n'entends pas le mal. Même si je vois l'apparence du mal, je ne l'accepte pas comme réalité. Je le vois comme une ombre que je ne déteste, n'aime ni ne crains. Je vois Dieu seul, Dieu apparaissant comme la vie de tout être. Great. Thank you. Thank you for joining. So I was like, wow, I just just come to the quiet place and, and that opens up in you. That's unbelievable. It's great to experience that. And and we share it together in in becoming still. And that's such a lovely, uh, say, uh, activity, you could say, or s s such a lovely recognition that we have in this moment that we come together, just becoming completely quiet. Well, so now here we are in our tape group. We have the book, The World is New, and this book is written by Joel. Um, it is, say, a little bit slightly edited by Lorraine Sinclair, and the um, yeah, the book is actually made with a couple of transcripts or little booklets that Joel used a lot in the beginning time, say in fifty or in the years fifty, fifty four, something like this, and um, it, it tells you that in the beginning of the book. But it's not related directly to talks. Now, this is it's quite unique, except for the, the infinite way and uh, the practicing the present is probably also original. It's like the rest is all derived from talks of Joel and there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that because we use the transcripts too. And, and that's very helpful. And now with the YouTube, where you can actually read the transcript of the talk right away uh, without specifically having the transcript in a quite good, uh, say, uh, translation, um, that can be helpful. So we recognize that. But here in the book, um, I really love it that this book doesn't have a direct uh, tape references and that it's actually yeah Joel takes time to to actually put it on paper what he has to share and that can be very helpful now in this book and I see this in of course in all kinds of books that Joel puts together or have been put together like the parenthesis for instance in the heart of mysticism where he col where the collection of letters takes place but uh, the parenthesis in specifically is uh, full of prayers just like here in this book too there are a lot of short say meditations contemplations and now why is that in there and um, what do we actually say you could say like learn from it well here you have it it is Joel giving very specific instruction um, about what is going on when you could say 
It's like creative meditation, as he describes in the first chapter. Creative meditation takes place when you actually allow communication, communion uh, to take place. Now, that is uh, an experience, like a universal experience. And we come back to that later too with the tape, because it is continuously based on an, on an say, it doesn't matter how you call it, but this is about the universal experience of communication with your creator. That has to be the same for everyone, no matter what background you have, no matter what seeming religion you have been following, or spiritual um, study you're actually doing. This universal experience is one thing that we share together. It has to be one, otherwise it wouldn't be it. Now that's of course very interesting. Um, if you look at it from a perspective of that there are many spiritual paths and many different ways to get to it, then you lose track of, of your comprehension, you could say. You lose track of it because there's no way of uh, actually following what's going on. So there's no sense in trying to understand how this works, except for this one fact, uh, which is the recognition that this is all about you. And it has nothing to do with any other path. And it has nothing to do with any other one doing this. And because and Joel mentions this many times, it's like, now this relates back to you. That's that's what is important. Now, say everything, and, and we read this in a moment because it's literally in the text too. It's like, um, um, you accept, in fact, the recognition that it all comes from you, from your withinness. That makes the world new. It's coming from your withinness not from anywhere else like there's no power outside of you there's nothing influencing you from outside no the power that's manifesting itself is literally manifesting through you and you're the one you could say directing it to others if you believe that there are others you can direct it to others and it comes back to you as uh, as a response or it comes back to you as an um, say a power a conflict or something like this but so in in this awakening process in this transformation of the way that we're looking at ourselves uh, following the instructions given to us by Jesus by Joel in this it's like bring it back the I that I am is already in me it is already saying it is the only power within you that is actually real and creates something that is real on a continuing basis now i can say use my mind in in the middle of it as some kind of well this power is great i can use that for my own will too i can i can direct it and put it in places that I think should be beneficial to me at this point. You know, this is where, where things got a bit sour. You could say things didn't work out because suddenly you were investing, like literally bringing your, um, bringing your power to ideas that are not real. And it manifested the world with evil, with discords, with conflict, with opposites with with all ingredients of the limited uh, perspective of a human being you gave that power so now in our transformational process in fact everything is coming back to you and you start to forgive you start to say like okay yeah that's coming from me yeah that's not coming from anyone i don't need to point out to my brother that he did that to me or that it's coming from somewhere else no i'm actually taking responsibility for it uh, recognizing that it is a universal mesmerism you could say because the ideas are just there but i gave them power i chose to give them power and say suffer the consequences of it suddenly i find myself in a body suddenly i find myself in a diseased body well that didn't come from god suddenly i find myself in an accident suddenly i find myself in the ic 
the intensive care. And what did I do? It's like unbelievable. You know, it's unbelievable what you have manifested and don't see yourself as the maker of it. But Joel says it, it will come back. It's like it's, it's what karma is. It's like it will come back to you um, for the release of it, for the healing of it, for recognizing I, w I didn't know what I was doing. I really thought it had nothing to do with me. I thought it was happening to me. So I'm sharing with you now one part in which it becomes pretty clear what I'm sharing, uh, what I was sharing just a moment ago. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, this is exactly what I mean. You listen to this. My divine consciousness imbued with the Christ is the law unto all creation. Nothing in this world acts upon me. I am the law unto all that appears in my universe. The activity of God, the universal I, the one ego, as Joel calls it, individualized as me, is the law unto all creation. See, this is an not so easy to hear statement. My divine consciousness imbued with the Christ is the law unto all creation. We, we say yes to that immediately. Yes, of course, that's true. If, if I'm in the realization of my Christ mind, if I'm consciously aware of my, say, Christ mind, my whole mind, my mind that is in communication with every aspect of creation, it is the law unto all creation. No doubt about it. It is the only thing there is, in other words. Nothing in this world acts upon me. Yeah? If I think something is acting upon me in this world, I'm, I'm not in my say in uh, fully aware of my christ consciousness i am the law unto all that appears in my universe i'm literally dictating it what it is on a moment by moment basis i dictate what the universe is whatever thought i have i become whatever thing that seems to be occurring i literally say um yeah it's it's like a you you are the one determining that the activity of god the universal i the one ego individualized as me is the law unto all creation now this this is good to to take another look at because it is the law unto all creation if i'm in alignment with my true self with the Christ, with my Christ mind. If I'm aligned with that, then of course that is true. Then of course that is, uh, it has no opposite. If my mind, you could say, if my uh, consciousness is whole and I'm fully aware of every aspect of it, like it, I'm entering into a sphere of knowing, then it makes total sense. I thought I hear sound. Do I hear sound? No. Sometimes I hear that. It's, it must be in the one second. Okay. Just want to make sure that it's quiet in the background. So here, uh, this is really important. Uh, important in understanding what Joel is actually sharing. Otherwise, you miss it. So if you read over it and say like, yes, okay, Christ is, um, when my mind is imbued with Christ, then um, I say I'm the law unto all creation. But to stand still with it, let it actually sink in and say, trying to say, open yourself up on a continuing basis for, for your Christ uh, mind, Christ consciousness is, is a practice. And this is called the infinite way. It's like the practice of coming into the recognition that there's only one of us, that there's Christ consciousness in say limitless um, unbound 
Like it is not limited in any kind of way in relationship with its creator, with its fa with your father. Like there's no place where the father ends and where you begin and vice versa. That is huge. <laughs> so that is huge. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's actually put on paper. Can you imagine? Joel actually wrote this down. He sat down behind the desk writing this down. Like this is exactly how that is. This is this is fact. This is not just an idea to think about. No, it's fact. So the necessity to to come to the recognition of wow my practice needs to be focused literally on releasing my say self-made identity coming to the recognition of my christhood and sinking deeper to that giving everything to god literally having my being having my relationship with god that's it like i'm dedicating myself to recognizing what that actually means. I will knock on the door. I will ask for it. Show me what it means to be in communication with my creator. I want to actually experience that. See, then it becomes uh, not just a concept, but it actually comes down into you. And this is exactly where you find your happiness and fulfillment. Of course, it is nowhere else to be found. There's only one way Joel says also in the book, there's only one way to find safety and security. And that is the spiritual way. That is the spiritual way. Like there's no other way to find safety and security. The way whereby the Christ becomes the reality of our being. See, there's the same story again. Coming back into your Christ experience of yourself, letting that your experience of that be total then you know what it means uh, safety and security up to that point nothing really happened so it's like um yeah joel shared it the other day in in one of the talks i'm getting out of this in one of the talks um that i shared in the rebirth sessions like he he calls it a plateau it's like if if i'm in my um, in my Christ awareness, it is there's a plateau, like it's it's high consciousness. All the time that I'm say experiencing, I'm not there. I'm actually say coming off that plateau and falling into a valley of denial and doubt. And up to the moment that I experience myself as being raised up to the plateau, that. Now this is this is really great to uh, as an example just to keep keep that for yourself is where actually find, do I find myself in my experience of myself during the day or when I wake up I'm sitting by myself just doing my exercise my meditation for a moment it's like Joel says in the book too it's like you can only get this through meditation you will have to be quiet it will has to it will have to come to you by your stillness, by you being quiet, by you allowing a shift to occur, releasing your great ideas, releasing your um, misfortune, releasing your um, sense of unsafety, releasing all aspects of your human definition of yourself. Now it can open up. Now there's a new world suddenly arising. Christ has entered my awareness and is fully there. It's like it's right here. There's a bright light of Christ in my mind. Suddenly there's space for that because I become quiet. Now my experience of myself is not comparable to any kind of human experience, even the happiest ones. You know, there's still no comparison to it. So, yeah, this is what Joel shares with us too in the talk. So he's he's entering into the idea of preparing the soil and uh, uses uh, different uh, traditions, you could say, of getting to that point. 
So what do you call it, Emmanuel? What do you call it, Christ, Buddha, whatever? It really does not matter. We're entering into a universal experience, which is you, your individual experience, not anyone else's. Do you care how that is called? No, you just entered into this, the place in yourself where words don't matter at all when the Christ enters into your consciousness, like when you actually become aware of your Christ consciousness. Words have little meaning now. It's like, why would I want to call anything? <laughs> why would I want to call anything anything? It's like, no, I hardly have time to say thank you. Thank you, God. I'm so grateful for this experience. I'm so grateful for what uh, is mine, what is given by you, what I can share with my brothers in a moment of real communication where I don't even have to say anything in order to communicate, but just say being in a constant recognition of the instantaneousness, like the immediacy of setting each other free continuously, not binding, not limiting, not defining, not examining, not competing, not comparing, none of these activities, just pure bright energy, uh, say radiating from you, recognizing it in your brother, increasing the joy by that. So that's really where Joel is uh, pointing at. Uh, in this talk that we're going to listen to. So now that's what I'm going to share with you. I think there was a time when if I had said that I'm happy to be back here in New York, I wouldn't really have meant it. There was a time when I moved to the West, passed through New York, about how wonderful it is that this chapter is ended. I know better now. It is really and truly a pleasure to come back here to New York. It is equally a pleasure to go wherever I'm called. In these years, I've learned a tremendous lesson. And that is that there is no such thing as a good city or a bad city. I had already learned years and years ago through my travels abroad that there's no such thing as a nation of good people or a nation of bad people. There are good and there are bad in all lands. But it has nothing to do with the land itself. It just has to do with the fact that in human nature there is both good and evil. And so when we learn that there is nothing good or bad but thinking makes it so, that is an accurate statement. That is a truthful statement. In the same way as many of you <clears throat> perhaps refer to those good old days. I have done that many, many times, and then had people who were suffering either disease or poverty, unhappiness of some sort in those very good old days, say, what was so good about them? And so it is that in these days that so much of the world is calling very bad days, hard times, not necessarily economically, because temporarily there is in many places in the world a false prosperity. But even those that are enjoying that false prosperity realize that it is false, that underneath there is nothing substantial to support it, and wonder just when the balloon is going to burst. So that if you were to judge from appearances, there were good old days and uh, 
these for many are good old, will someday be called good old days. There are some cities better than others, some climates better than others, some localities better than others. But that is all in accord with one's attitude at a particular time. I was in a flower shop one day in Hawaii, and uh, the lady who was managing it had just been explaining to me that uh, she had come over some months before on a visit, loved it so much that she went home, broke up her home where she had married children and had some grandchildren, came over to Hawaii where she would have to live alone, no family and no friends, and work for her living. I said she would rather be doing that than to be home with her own family and her own relatives and uh, to be supported because Hawaii was so wonderful. And while she was explaining that to me, a guest of the hotel came in, ordered something in the way of flowers, and she began to speak to him about how wonderful today is and isn't, uh, don't you find Hawaii uh, enchanting? And he said, you know, I'm getting irritated with this thing about Hawaii. I can't see anything good here, and I've made my reservations to get out of town. <laughs> well, <clears throat> there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so, until you find a principle of life that changes your entire attitude, and you begin to see that really and truly, not only that there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so, but actually there is nothing good or bad. The only thing that is, there is a world, and this is it. But the complexion of it depends on our approach to it, or our attitude to it, or our reaction to it. There really is no such thing as a world that is good and bad, or a city good and bad. There is no such thing as a people good or bad. The world has, in my day, and that means in the day of many of you here tonight, gone through two terrific world wars, and a third one uh, somewhat less in intensity and duration, and certainly all of this time with the prospects of another one just around the corner. And so, uh, you might say, that we have been a generation, except in the very earliest days uh, of our experience, a generation living on the edge of a volcano. And there are some younger than most of us who have no recollection even of those good old days of peace or intervals between wars, and who have only the recollection of the wars, the depression, the lack, and uh, the jazz age. Now, <clears throat> a student of history can tell you that this same picture has been going on since time began. There never has been a time that could rightly be called the good old days. There were wars, rumors of wars, continuation of wars, all through that period of the, of the Hebrew history before Christ and famine, and drought, and locusts, and all of the evils that you read about in modern papers. And uh, after the time of the Master, during and after, there were persecutions, there were wars, there were tyrannies. Civilizations have disappeared from the face of the globe, and again, continuity of warfare, 100-year war, 30-year war, War of the Roses, War of the American Independence, Indian Wars, 
War of 1812, Civil War, Spanish-American War. There just seems to be no end to wars and to depressions. This is the history of mankind. This is the history of the human race. And uh, the question that comes to the mind of every thinker is this. Are these to be the histories also of the future generations? And if so, why should we go on having children? Why be so happy about having grandchildren if they have nothing to look forward to but being cannon fodder? And worse, because whereas in the old days it was only the soldiers and the inhabitants of the cities under attack that uh, had direct danger, but now there isn't anyone in an isolated place on the face of the globe that isn't subject to the terrors of present-day warfare. And uh, a man and a woman would rightly be able to say to themselves, why should we have children? Why should we encourage our children to have children if warfare and depression and locusts are to be the future of these children? The answer to all of that is this. From the earliest days of which we have record, men have been, and women have been reaching out for something greater than themselves. Men and women have been reaching out for something upon which they could lean, something upon which they could depend to relieve these conditions of mankind, of warfare, of humanness, and uh, in some measure, a few have found the answer to that riddle. Those few have found peace on earth. Some of those have been able to say with the Master, I have overcome the world. Some have been able to actually live in the world and not be of it. Some have been able to go through their entire lifespan without feeling it the effects of warfare, depressions, lack, limitation, unemployment, drought. But those few are those who attained some measure of spiritual realization. In uh, the libraries of the world, you will find books on mysticism, books that were given to the world by mystics, that is, those who attain their conscious realization of God. And uh, you'll be surprised how many of those all came to the same conclusion as the others who had attained that realization. In other words, whether the mystics were of China or Japan, later of India, or whether they were of the Hebrew days or the latter Christian days, every mystic, every individual who attained inner realization found the self same thing. They called it by different names. Naturally, the languages differ. And so it is that it is only natural that in China they should have called it Tao, and in India, they should have called it Brahm, Atman, that in uh, Japan, they should have called it by some other name, Darshan. It is only natural that the Hebrews should have called it Emmanuel, or God with us, or that when the Greeks translated the uh, Hebrew documents, that instead of Emmanuel, they should have called it Christ. For these words mean, in every language, they mean and refer to one thing. The Spirit of God 
that is in every individual. Now, what name you give it makes a difference. What your language is, or what particular era you were born in, will determine the name that you give it. But that which you are naming, remember, is the Spirit of God that dwells in man. You can call it a Messiah. Well, the Hebrews made a great mistake. I shouldn't say the Hebrews, I should say some Hebrews. When the Messiah was prophesied, they thought that they were referring to a man. And they were looking for a man to come on earth who in some miraculous way was going to save it. Of course, there never could be such a thing as a man saving a world. There are too many parts of the world. There are many two different types of nature. There are too many teachings in the world. No one man could appeal to the monotheism of the Hebrews and to the paganism of the Romans and the Greeks of that particular era. No one man could have uh, satisfied the needs of the Hebrews of the Holy Land and at the same time satisfied the needs of the Hindus in India and the Chinese and China. The Savior couldn't be a man, but they didn't realize that. And so they centered their hopes in a man instead of in the Messiah, which means uh, in Greek the Christ, which means in English Savior, which actually is Emmanuel or the presence of God. The Savior was prophesied, and the Savior was revealed by Jesus Christ to be the comforter or the Spirit of God in you, which he called my Father and your Father. The Father within me, he doeth the works, my Father and your Father. Paul carried this on later in the teaching of an indwelling Christ, which he said, through which I can do all things. Through Christ I can do all things. He didn't say through a man. The man had already left the earth 30 odd years before that statement was made. But that which that man uttered remained on earth. And as a matter of fact, he said it was on earth before he was, before Abraham was, I am. You can only understand what that means when you understand who Abraham was. Abraham was the actual beginning of the Hebrew race, the father of the Hebrew race. And so the Master says, before there was a Hebrew race, before the Hebrew race began, before its creator or originator was on earth, I am. In other words, Christ is. The Spirit of God is. Even before there's a Hebrew race to enjoy it. And he says, I will be with you unto the end of the world. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Imagine the man who had said, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you, saying in the next breath, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Was he contradicting himself? No, not at all. He meant what he said. If I, Jesus, go not away, you will be relying on me to such an extent that the Christ itself, the Holy Comforter, will not come to your conscious awareness. And uh, I had better get away from here while there is still time for you to realize that Christ is. Before Abraham was, Christ is. And until the end of the world, Christ is. As the Father within you. As the very Christ of your being. As the very Emmanuel. As the very presence of God in you. Now, in his teaching, 
the master told us something that today must be brought back to your conscious awareness and mind if we are ever to transcend these human conditions which will keep on in the future as they have in the past unless we learn them. If you abide in me, let my word abide in you, you will bear fruit richly. If you do not abide in this word, if you do not let this word abide in you, you will be as the branch that is cut off and wither it. He was repeating the 91st Psalm, those that dwell in the secret place of the Most High, none of these evils will come nigh their dwelling place. He never denied that there are evils, but they will not come nigh your dwelling place. All of the evils of the world will not come nigh those who live in this word and let this word live in them. Do you remember this? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, do you know what that is, the word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? It isn't anything that you speak. It isn't anything that I speak. It isn't anything that any minister, rabbi, or priest speaks. It is a word that God speaks, that you shall live by. And where does God utter that? If God utters it in me, then I can live by that. But that doesn't save you. The proof of that is that God uttered it in Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Isaiah, Elijah, Elisha, Jesus, John, Paul. Has it saved the world from these disasters from then until now? No, it saved those in whom, to whom, through whom the word was spoken. The message of the infinite way, which is nothing more nor less than my individual experience, the experience that I've lived my own lifetime, is this. The word of God to which I am receptive and which utters itself in me, that has been the power that has lifted me out of many sicknesses, out of much worldliness, into this particular life which I've been living for 27 years, and without the benefit of money, advertising, promotion, influence, it has carried this message of the infinite way around the entire Protestant world. It has found receptivity throughout that world. It has found acceptance and welcome, and it has certainly blessed many who are here, who are in every city where I talk, to bear witness to the fact that they have benefited by this message. Actually, is it the message that has benefited them? And I will say to you, no, this benefit can't benefit you any more than your own Bible can benefit you, or whatever church you were raised in can benefit you, and frankly, none of them can. All they can do, if you are willing, is to lead you back within yourself to where you learn to contemplate God and the things of God, abide in the Word and let the Word abide in you, until you yourself begin to receive the Word of God in you, which becomes your Messiah, your Christ, your Emmanuel, your Tao, your Darshan. The Master revealed that the kingdom of God is within you, and he didn't make you dependent on any man or book or teaching. In fact, he said that the kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there, and that you do not have to worship 
in a holy mountain or in a temple, since the kingdom of God is within you. The allness, the realm of God is within you. The word of God is nigh unto thee. One of our mystical poets says, closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. The Old Hebrew Testament says, in your very mouth. Let it then be clearly understood that the world that lives without the word of God that proceeds out of the mouth of God is a world that has been living in war, torment, poverty, prosperity temporarily, peace for a few years, back again into the old routine of trouble. And uh, if the world continues in that same uh, way of living, it will again have peace and war. It will again have prosperity, bust and boom, boom and bust. There is no way to change that for the simple reason that there is nothing in the human world that can overcome that which we call human nature. You know, there are groups in our infinite way circles, groups of students who have been together in classes, groups who have met with me in different cities, some who have been with me when my home was here in the east and some when my home was in the west and some who have been in my home in the uh, Hawaiian Islands. There have been many with me in London and uh, South Africa, Holland, Sweden, wherever these records go, these tapes, there are those who will bear witness that we have been in class together and uh, that among us there is no possibility of strife. There is not one of us who would sue another. There is not one of us who would fight another. There is not one of us who would try to steal one another's wife or husband or child. And uh, not because we're such good humans, but because we have been touched by an inner spirit and we have all become one in Christ Jesus. That is, we have all become one in spiritual brotherhood. Remember, we are not only Americans and Canadians, we are English and we are Dutch and we are Swedish and we are South Africans and we are North Africans, some in India and some in Australia. We come of all peoples, all colors, all races, but in our infinite way work we have become one in a spiritual brotherhood, sisterhood, one in a spiritual bond, and uh, the love is really love. For in it, that we each retain and sustain our individuality, yet there is that inner bond between us that makes strife, theft, and so forth, an impossibility. Now, if this is true, with even a few groups of a dozen or two dozen, it is true of the entire world as a possibility. If it is possible for a dozen or two dozen people to live as individuals, each living their own life, maintaining their own identity, and yet with such a bond between them that they meet year after year after year after year without strife, then it must be possible for the world to live that way, and it is. But here's the secret. Supposing I illustrate it in this manner. I have realized I and the Father are one. All that the Father hath is mine. The kingdom of God is within me. Now, in a measure, I have realized that. Undoubtedly, I can realize it in a tremendously greater degree. But, in a measure at least, I have realized that. And because of that, I need nothing that you have. I ask for nothing that you have. 
I require nothing that you have. All that the Father hath is mine. If by chance I have a need of any kind, I can turn within, feel that presence, and in its due time, whatever it is that has to be in my experience appears. Whether it's in the nature of a person, as friend, companion, associate, patient, student, publisher, banker, regardless of what form of person or thing or activity is necessary, I don't have to ask you for it. I can turn within and realize my oneness with the Father, with the Source, and then wait patiently, and it appears. Now then, around this globe where I have taught, there are those individuals who have likewise attained that realization so that they know now that they don't even need Joel. They don't even need a teacher anymore. They require nothing and nobody because now they have attained an inner awareness. Oh, thank you. I and the Father are one. The place where on I stand is holy ground. Thank you so much for joining today in the first the world is new a moment together thank you so much for joining so um we continue next week with uh, the next chapter let me take a look which what the title is and then the next one will be unfolding the healing consciousness so that's that's going to be interesting too it's like lovely to to dive back into a book of Joel and to discover more. So thank you for doing that uh, with me and um, wishing you a really great uh, week, beautiful, say, day today. And um, I'm playing some music to, to stay in the celebration of the remembrance of the Christ realization within you where all is possible you know where where you actually fulfill your function